Welcome to Beyond the Coverage, I'm Chris Horner. Today's episode brought to you by Bicycle, the largest global marketplace for pre-owned bikes. With over 20,000 high quality pre-owned and refurbished bikes available, Bicycle connects the buyers and sellers to make the process of buying and selling bikes safe, easy, and convenient. Sellers, remember to use the code BUTTERFLYEFFECT24 for 0% seller fee. Now let's get into today's Butterfly Effect and Beyond the Coverage episode. It's kind of a little bit of a blend because we're going back to yesterday's stage 15, the remarkable stage that we saw Tade Pagacar solo and put three minutes into all the GC favorites. Well, I had one of the, com one of the comments on my channel from Jordan and he says, would Tade Pagacar, in your opinion, would he have dropped Jonas Vinigo on yesterday's stage. First off, I don't think he would have dropped Jonas Vinigo. I don't think he would have dropped Primoz Roglic, and then maybe not even Remco Evnipol. A little bit more question about the Belgian kid, because Belgian kids' forms a little more fluctuating up and down. But Jonas Vinigo at his best, I don't think he gets dropped by Tade Pogacar in yesterday's stage 15. Same with Primoz Roglic. Now, would they have gotten dropped 500 meters where it gets really steep on yesterday's stage 15 from Tade Pogacar? Well, the tactics would have been completely different and the scenario would have been completely different on yesterday's stage 15. You're going, Chris, what would have been different? The whole team would have been different. The whole pacing on that 222 kilometer stage. When Jordan and a lot of my friends and a lot of the comments are saying, Tade Pogacar is on another level. I'm going over to Garrett Thomas's interview after the stage where he says, once Tade Pogacar got up the road, Garrett Thomas decided that it was best to start looking at the other riders in the podium position. Danny Martinez is who he's talking about. And certainly Ben O'Connor and Tiberi there from Bahrain Victorious. He's worried about those guys. Once they play the cat and mouse game that Garrett Thomas, his words, not mine, say they started playing there with Tade Pogacar, Sure, Tadej Pogacar gains a minute and a half, maybe a two-minute gap on the GC favorites back there, but he doesn't gain three. He gains three because Garen Thomas said they were playing cat and mouse. That means the pace slow. How do I know it slowed? Well, we saw Caruso back there from Bahrain Victorious who got dropped with the first initial accelerations. We saw our Innsman who couldn't hold the gap at the front and ended up dropping from the front. Garen Thomas took over, then he pulled off the front. And our Innsman comes back into the group. And later we see our Innsman pulling at the very finish of yesterday's 220 kilometer stage. So that's a sign right there with, with Caruso getting dropped, coming back, with our Innsman struggling, not quite getting dropped, but struggling, and then capable of riding the front, that the pace back there was slower because they're playing tactical games. They know right here, all of the GC guys in the top 10, certainly second through fifth, and then you go up to our Ensman who started yesterday stage around 10th. He's interested in moving up further because he certainly wants to get ahead of Tiberi there and move himself in the top five. Those riders, along with Bardet, Bardet's going to be cagey. He's getting better and better. We're going to see him start playing deeper into these mountain stages coming up after the rest day here of stage, after the second rest day here at the Giro d'Italia. We're going to start seeing Bardet get a little bit better too. So all of the GC guys outside of Tade Bogaccia, they're all racing for second and third. Garrett Thomas raced a spectacularly intelligent race at the finish. He knows there's nothing he can do about Tade Pogacar. Tade Pogacar is going to win the Giro d'Italia. He's going for the double. It started yesterday. It's going to continue this next week where the Slovenian's going to back off a little bit. If, if they have opportunities for Tade Pogacar to win the stage, he's going to go for it, but they're not going to win, use big time energy except for maybe one more mountain stage. Other than that, I think the Slovenian's going to back off. So, Garrett Thomas knows second place is available for him at the Giro d'Italia, and he's thinking financially, and he's thinking about his family. He's thinking, well, I didn't ride good in February. I didn't ride good in March. I didn't ride good in April. Now I need to ride good here at the Giro, and I need to do something at the Tour de France. If he finishes second here at the Giro, he doesn't have to worry about what happens at the Tour de France. He just needs to be there to help out his teammates. And if he can get a podium at the Tour de France or a top five is more realistic for Garrett Thomas at the Tour de France, he's going to have a solid season on this 2024 year. And he knows the team's going to be happy with him because nobody can beat Tade Pogacar, Jonas Vinigo, Primoz Roglic, and Remco Evnipol when he's on his top form. Remco, that is. The other three guys, they're spectacular. But when we go back to Garrett Thomas, He's thinking, safety today on stage 15, let Tadej Pogacar go away, keep the group with me, be second on the general classification when we're going into the next mountain stages, 
It's supposed to be raining. It's supposed to be miserable. Maybe this Slovenian, Tade Pogacar, has some bad luck, crashes, breaks a collarbone, breaks an arm, breaks a leg. Maybe he gets sick. Maybe COVID strikes. And then Garen Thomas is the second oldest Grand Tour winner in the galaxy. I'm the first oldest Grand Tour winner, and Garen Thomas isn't going to beat my record, so I'm not scared. But he could legitimately, right now here at the Giro d'Italia, Garen Thomas, if he's careful like he was on stage 15, something bad happens to just one rider. I always say, when I'm dissecting races, doing tactics, I always say one rider could have a bad moment, one rider could crash, something bad could happen to him, and then you could stand a chance of moving up and winning that specific race. And even when we go back to the Basque Country, you saw Jonas, Primos, and of course, we, and of course Remco Evnipol crash on that stage four. So that's three guys, but that is a rare. That is so rare and so unpredictable that that could happen that if Garen Thomas was sitting fifth, he'd just lay everything on the line and probably start racing for stages. But because he can be second right now at the Giro, because something could happen to Tade Pogacar, Garen Thomas is going into safety mode on yesterday stage two. Now, I want to bring up another interview that happened today on the rest day when we're talking Tade Pogacar. The journalist is asking Tade Pogacar how spectacular was yesterday's ride. Well, Tade Pogacar, the Slovenian, thinks exactly the same way I did when I was watching it live yesterday. It was an explosive day. It was explosive day it was magnificent ride to gain that kind of time on all of the GC favorites here at the Giro. But no, it's not his highlight. No, it doesn't compare to his two Tour de France wins. No, it doesn't compare to his monument, especially Tour of Flanders. That was a huge, big ride for a rider of Tade Pogacar's statue to beat Matthew Vanderpool to win a monument and beat Walt Van Aert at that same monument for Flanders' win. That was a big win. And then, of course, LBL, the wins over at Lombardy would be highly ranked, but nowhere near that Flanders and that LBL win when you're looking over at Lombardy because... Tade Pogacar knows when you look at Lombardi that the other favorites at that race when he's won it three different times, they're not the same kind of caliber of fitness or riders that we're going to see at the Tour de France level. Like I've told you guys many times, only two times during the season, two times only, are the professional peloton all at their absolute best level. The Tour de France is the first. There's no doubt about that. It's in July. The weather's the best. We all know the focus and the cameras, the attention of the teams, the media, the, spectac the spectacle of the Tour de France itself is above anything in the world. The next biggest time of the season when everybody's on their best or near their best form is going to be that April time when you have the Basque Country, you have the classics up north when we're talking Flanders, Roubaix, and then of course my favorite time of the year for the classics is always going to be Amstel Gold, Flesh, and Liege, Best on Liege because you have the classic flatter, flatter specialists meet up at that race. You have the GC guys coming from the Basque Country that are 100% focused. And that moment is the second strongest moment of racing in the European peloton. Tade Bocaccio knows that. That's why Lombardi is going to be a big, big plus onto his resume. But LBL, and course to our Flanders are going to outrank Lombardi, I believe, and I believe Tade Pogacar thinks the same way. When we look again at Tade Pogacar's yesterday's victory, his win there, the time gap, I know it was big, but it's not enough to drop Jonas Vinigo. Jonas Vinigo, Tade Pogacar, Primoz Roglic are three riders that I would love to have on my team. And if you said, which one would you pick first? I would go Tade Pogacar. It gets a little bit complicated second, but I would probably take Jonas just because he's younger than Primoz Roglic. But I would take Primoz Roglic if you said, hey, I need you to perform right here at this moment throughout the whole season so that I can get another contract for the team next year. I'm taking Primoz Roglic because I know he's going to win big throughout the whole year. And the only thing you got to cross your fingers on, hopefully that Slovenian doesn't crash anywhere throughout the season. Otherwise, you know Primoz Roglic is always going to have a host of victories that you can bring to a sponsor and say, hey, we need $40 million, $50 million budget. Jonas Vinigo is a rider that can win the Tour de France. We know it. We saw him win twice. I believe his first win in 2022 was a little bit more help tactically from UAE Team Emirates, who I believe throughout this Giro d'Italia, UAE Team Emirates tactically have raced pretty good with the exception of Stage 1. And when we look at yesterday's Stage 15, everyone thinks, wow, UAE Team Emirates were so strong. They weren't that strong. 
There was 50 riders in that front group that weren't working well together. Nairo Quintana was caught with 1.9 kilometers to go and lost by 30 seconds. We'll add another 10 or 15 to Tadej Pogacar's time because maybe if somebody's back there a little bit closer, the Slovenian goes a little bit harder. But at most, 40 seconds, 45 seconds is Nairo Quintana's loss in yesterday's stage 15 to Tadej Pogacar. That tells us what? That tells us that if that break of 50 had worked together and gained one more minute, they already started that 14 kilometers to go to the finish, Nairo Quintana, that is, and the breakaway guys with about a three-minute gap on the Slovenian Tadej Pogacar when he attacked. So if he had four minutes at that moment, if he had five minutes at the start of the Mortirolo, then you know Nairo Quintana most likely wins yesterday's stage 15, and no one's talking about how spectacular of a ride that Tadej Pogacar had. That means when you look at stage 15, UAE Team Emirates, they made tactical mistakes. We saw Machine talk about how the team was perfect. It was perfect on yesterday's stage 15. As perfect as UAE Team Emirates could be in stage 15, they were. They were perfect. Where were the tactical mistakes then, Chris? What are you talking about? The tactical mistakes are just like I told you on yesterday's butterfly effect. Mikhail Bjerg did, went too hard in an individual time trial. That left them shorter rider. They brought their sprinter, Milano, here to the Giro d'Italia. That left them short of power on yesterday's stage 15 so that when that group goes up the road, they can't control the time as deep. They don't have the depth, UAE team members, to ride 220 kilometers or 210 kilometers in yesterday's stage and still bring the win or guarantee the win that Tadej Pogacar did on yesterday's stage 15. In order for Tadej Pogacar to have won yesterday's stage, he needed the circumstances of the race to play out the way they did. He needed 50 riders to go up the road and not work well together. He needed Cometa that had five riders in that front group to not start working until the valley section after the group of six went up the road. He needed Albacine de Kunic to send guys up in that group of six. He needed Caleb Ewan not to rotate through with the group of 50 when they were caught because he had Demarquee De in that group along with another teammate. So Caleb Ewan should have been rotating on the front along with everybody else. I'm only throwing Caleb Ewan under the bus right now because we know he's not going to win yesterday's stage under any circumstances. Was Caleb Ewan going to win yesterday's stage? So if you're not going to win, start riding the front. Nairo Quintana's team, I can look over at Movistar and say, Pelea Sanchez, he should have started riding for Nairo Quintana. I can look over at Pseudo Quickstep and say, Mari Van Savinov should have 100% been selling out at the front of that 50 rider group, 100% for Julian Alaphilippe, who's already won a stage here at the Giro d'Italia. So again, when I look at UAE Team Emirates Machine's comments of saying they're perfect, yes, I believe with the Spaniard, the director sportif there of UAE team members, that they were perfect from kilometer zero to the finish of yesterday's magnificent win for Tadej Pogacar. But were they perfect when you look at the hole here at the Giro d'Italia? No, they weren't. They came underpowered here to, to control this stage 15. And like I said, needed the tactics of the goofy knuckleheads up there in the group of 50 to sit up and come back. They needed the tactics of Kofidis to control the early parts of that stage 15, which allowed Tadej Pogacar never to go in the red. When everyone's looking at the stage and they're going, wow, his numbers were so amazing. Tadej Pogacar says in his interview today on the rest day that it's hard to compare numbers. He doesn't want to tell us. His numbers might have been the best they've ever been. But if they were the best they've ever been on yesterday's stage 15, it's because Kofidis rode the first flat section going into the first mountain, which meant that Tadej Pogacar didn't have to do any acceleration. The first two climbs with Milano riding the front. Guys, with a little bit of training, I'm about 150 pounds, 148 this morning when I woke up. If I took five pounds off, got about two months, three at the most, Milano's not dropping me and I'm 52 years old. It's not going to happen. So when they're going up the first two climbs there with Milano setting tempo at the front with Rui Oliveira, what's happening back there to Tadej Pogacar? He's resting. He's going up those climbs. He's not even feeling this, guys. He's not panicking at any moment. He's not under stress. He's not missing any calories because the pace is so easy that he's always remembering. He's always thinking straight in his head the first two climbs. It's a 222-kilometer stage. I need to be good for the last four kilometers, if not the last 20 kilometers of today's race because I didn't come with a very strong team and I got my sprinter on the front right now, so I don't know what the gap will be up to these 50 riders in the break. But 
because I know I need to be good, because the pace isn't going fast up these first two climbs, I'm gonna eat, I'm gonna drink, I'm gonna stay hydrated. I don't ever have to do a big acceleration. I don't ever have my muscles getting torn up. Then he hits the last 14 kilometers to go. Just before that 1K, he's telling Rafael Micah to throw down with everything he's got on the pedals. That was the first aggressive moment Tade Pogaccio had put into, into the pedals on yesterday's stage 15. That's why when I see the comments and they're asking about Jonas Vinigo getting dropped on yesterday's stage, absolutely not. Jonas Vinigo would have been there with Tade Pogacar and it would have been a tactical battle or will be a tactical battle, I should say, in July when we see Primoz Roglic there, we see Jonas there, we see Rimko Evnipol there, then we're going to see a magnificent battle. So yes, Tade Pogacar had a good ride in yesterday's Giro d'Italia, but it was, was it remarkable? No way the Slovenian Tade Pogacar has remarkable moments much sooner in his career so far for the Slovenian that yesterday's stage does not rank high enough. What will rank high enough in yesterday's stage is that starts the talk of the double coming up in the Tour de France for July 2024 when all four riders meet up and then you'll see what I'm talking about where the Slovenian tactically better bring his best team because today's team will not get it done in, in the July Tour de France in 2024. So Tade Pogacar, Jonas Vinigo, Remco Abnapol, Primoz Roglic, they all better come on their A game for the Tour de France in July because one of those riders, if not all four, are going to be spectacular and nobody wants to lose the 24 Tour de France out of those four favorites. Make sure you guys like and subscribe. I'll see you guys for the Butterfly Effect Stage 16 of the Giro d'Italia in tomorrow's edition.